Peter and John were going up to the temple area for the three o'clock hour of prayer. And a man crippled from birth was carried and placed at the gate of the temple called the beautiful gate every day to beg for alms from the people who entered the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. But Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. He paid attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, I have neither silver nor gold, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise and walk. Then Peter took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles grew strong. He leaped up, stood, and walked around, and went into the temple with them, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized, recognized him as the one who used to sit begging at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with amazement and astonishment at what had happened to him. Verum Domini. Be 
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Dominus Fobiscum. Lexius Sancti Evangelii Secundum, Lucan. Gloria That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, Cleopas, said to him in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, what sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him but that we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. When they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us, while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he had made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Verbum Domini. Throughout this whole week, we celebrate the octave of Easter. Every day is a celebration of Easter, hence we proclaim the glory, uh, which we don't do in the other weekdays during Easter time, but during these days we do. 
And in many parts of the world, the Middle East and elsewhere, they don't greet each other with normal hellos, but they greet each other with the words, Christ is risen, indeed he is risen. And you'll hear that in the various languages. And we, not only in the Roman rite, but in the other rites, will read these gospels of the various appearances of Jesus after the resurrection. And in this way, we return ourselves to one of the most basic issues of the faith. Christ is not simply one more martyr. There are many, many martyrs inside the Catholic Church in the last 2,000 years. It's been about 75 million martyrs have been killed for our faith. And as you remember, more than half of those died in the 20th century alone, 40 of the 75 million. And these people have died, and they did so because, as we saw this past Sunday, with over 300 of them, that they died because they believe Christ is more than a martyr. He died, truly, and suffered in a heroic way. But there's something more to it. It is a death that is for our salvation and a resurrection that brings new life. This is key to our faith. This is what makes Christ distinctive among all the various other leaders of religion. And we see this very important component in all of these episodes of Jesus' appearance that the disciples and apostles all found it very difficult to believe. They did not say, yeah, it's the third day. Let's, let's wait for the resurrection. It should be about time. Well, of course, they didn't have watches. Barely had sundials. But they could tell, you know, that, you know, the death is a normal experience. Uh, this is something that happens, someone's dead. And you hear that in this conversation. The Passover was finished, and these two disciples were returning home at the, after having celebrated the first few days of Passover. And the Sabbath of Passover had been the day before. And on that Sabbath, Christ's body rested in the tomb as they all had to rest, but now they could begin their journey home. And they engage this stranger, which is not unusual when you're walking long distances and you meet somebody, it's not unusual to speak to strangers. Uh, this is a common thing. And they engage him, uh, well, he engages them, actually. This is a very important element. Christ takes the initiative to ask them, what are you discussing? as you walk. It's his initiative to come into their conversation. And this is a very important part of our own prayer life. You know, a lot of times people will talk about the importance of prayer, and they should, because it is important. But they sometimes speak as if prayer were primarily their activity primarily their search for God and their search for me and their search for inner peace and their search for quiet and so on. Whereas Christian prayer is a response to God's initiative. Remember that throughout the Bible, this is just one more example that throughout the Bible, 
It is the story of God's search for humanity. Not human beings searching for God. That's philosophy. But in the scriptures, it is God looking for us. All the way back to Adam and Eve hiding in the bushes. And God says, where are you? And here, Christ walks up to them and asks, what are you discussing? And they think he's the one who doesn't know what's going on. Not an uncommon approach by a lot of people in relation to God. They sometimes will talk so much in their prayers, and some people will even spend a lot of time in their prayer telling God how he's supposed to answer it. That's not unusual. People say, well, Lord, if you just do this, if you do this and this and this, then everything will be great. They, instead of listening to what God is saying. And that's when these two learn, is when they learn to listen to what Christ is saying to them. And this is, uh, you know, what they say, what happened, what they know what happened, uh, but their own concern, you know, they, they know the tomb is empty. That much they'll say. They, and witnesses, a variety of witnesses, but they, um, all they can conclude is they did not find his body. Now, actually, this is not bad. I, I don't mind this at all. This is good. This is someone who is willing to uh, listen to the evidence and not say more than the evidence requires or allows. You would think that certain news organizations ought to spend a lot of time studying these two guys. Just report what you know to be facts, not speculating. And then Jesus is the one who responds to this because here's where they did editorialize. We thought that he was the one who would redeem Israel. But the implication of that statement is, uh, he might not be. You know, all we've got is an empty tomb. And there were a variety of images for how to redeem Israel that even caused a lot of the Jewish people to split into a variety of parties. The zealots repeatedly tried to redeem Israel by getting into various wars and re revolutions that they lost every time. And they would continue that until they were wiped out in 72 at Mitzad, the last of them dies. And then you have others like the Essenes who sort of waited over in their own little corner expecting everybody else to die and they would be the only survivors. And they're just waiting, they're just standing back and calling themselves the sons of light and everybody else is the sons of darkness and they're all going to die and we're going to survive and that'll be it. And So he had these big expectations and apparently these disciples shared some of those expectations that there would be perhaps liberation from the Romans, the restoration of the kingdom of David and his empire, and we would be, oh, that is what they seem to expect. To which our Lord answers, oh, how foolish you are. How foolish you are. This is something that I've heard even in our own times. I especially would hear this in response to those who supported liberation theology. They would emphasize how they were building the kingdom of God. They were doing so by liberating all of the wealth from the wealthy, from the rich, and giving it to the poor. And then once the poor have the wealth, they will be um, a new paradise here on earth, or a kingdom of God here on earth. And building the kingdom as a just society um, is 
uh, was their idea of this. Now, we should be in favor of justice, of course. We should be in favor of everybody doing well uh, and bad people not taking from others, uh, either good or bad. We should be in favor of all that. But to say that that's building the kingdom of God may be just as foolish as these disciples for this reason, that once another group gets the wealth, they usually end up just as corrupt as the ones they got it from because they're all fallen creatures. They're all born rebels. They have original sin. And I've seen throughout my lifetime one group getting power and then becoming politically corrupt. Uh, in New York City, there used to be groups of Republican po uh, politicians who ran the various syndicates. They were voted out of office as part of reform, and then the, the Democrats came in and they did it. Same in my own city of Chicago. Uh, you change these things from one group to another, and they become as corrupt as the previous group. That's not the kingdom of God. That's not the kingdom of God. It is trying to get people to be honest, and that's good. But we have to keep in mind what God says about his kingdom. Primary issue is he's king. And that he is going to rule our hearts. He is going to transform all of us on all parties and all political issues. And all philosophies, he wants to transform us into his righteousness and holiness. That we see consistently. And what Christ does in responding to their foolishness about the expectation of the kingdom of Israel being restored is he goes through Moses and the prophets and explains the scriptures. He goes through them all. And I oftentimes thought, when, especially as a younger seminarian, I said, I wish St. Luke would have listed all those passages our Lord had spoken. He just says that he went through Moses and the prophets, but what were they? What was it in all the scriptures, the writings? Because that includes, besides the prophets, includes the histories and the other writings. And then, as I was studying, Actually, I was in the process of translating Acts. And then I saw, wait a minute. He did give us that list. Acts of the Apostles gives the various passages Christ had taught the Apostles, only we see them using it in the different contexts. It's laid out for us. And they incorporate those texts from the prophets, the writings, and Moses. And you see them so quoted again and again throughout. So we do have it. And this is something also important for us. Every so often, I still come across some people who say, why did you bother to study the Old Testament? Why did you spend so much time reading that? And I always found that a good answer to that was, well, Jesus did. I think if he thought it was a good idea, I might think it's a good idea. And if he's going to use it, maybe we Christians should. This was an early temptation in the church. The first crisis for the canon of scripture came from Marcion, who rejected everything Jewish, the whole Old Testament, and even the parts of the New Testament that were written by Jews. Well, <laughs> that's everything but Luke and Acts, though he accepted some of Paul. But uh, Paul was Jewish too, and that's foolish, foolish. We need to have our sense of 
our roots. It's very important to know church history. Very important to understand the New Testament and go into the Old Testament. Because then as you do, you see over and over again the prophecies about Christ. In fact, that's why the New Testament quotes the Old Testament 360 times. This is something that Christ considered so important. <laughs> and the integrity of our faith being rooted in the Old Testament is one of his points. He said, this is all heading in my direction. He is personally the one by which we have this lens to understand the Old Testament. And as he plans to go on, you see that they urge him to stay with them for this meal at the end of the day. Even then, when you know the scriptures, you realize that they use the same verb, slightly different form, different prefix, but it's the same verb used here as Lot used in Genesis 19, verse 3, for the angels to stay. And you see an allusion to Abram urging the three angels to stay with him too. And now they are urging Jesus to stay with them and have this meal. But he takes the meal to a new level when he blesses and breaks the bread and gives it to them. The same three verbs in the same sequence as at the multiplication of loaves and fish and at the first Eucharist at the Last Supper. Then their eyes are open. And it's not that they were the ones who figured it out. This ability to recognize Christ is an act of God. This is his grace working in them, just as it was Christ who took the initiative to engage them in this conversation because God is the one who is searching for us and we need to see our own prayer lives as a response to his gracious urging of us, we also see that their eyes are opened by God's gracious action. They come to this faith. Faith is something we enter into stage by stage, from one depth to another, from glory to glory, as St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians. We keep on going into more depth, and that's what these disciples do as well. And then all of a sudden, when, as soon as they recognize him, he's gone. But not permanently. They'll see him in a little while when they return to Jerusalem. We'll hear that tomorrow. But this is their experience that Christ did not just leave an empty tomb, but he is a real presence, a presence seen in the Word of God and a presence in the Eucharist. And we, in this Easter season, continue that. We read the Word of God. We are nourished by it. And then we receive the Eucharist and are nourished by it. And in this way, we also go from one level of faith to another.